We're ready, man. Uh, all right, let's do it. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Product Happy Hour, where you can go to happy hour with your favorite product people in your sweatpants. <laughs> we are product folks here to share what we've learned often the hard way over great drinks. Why happy hour? Why not? It's the best way to get the inside scoop from grizzled vets with the scars to prove it. Thanks for giving us a listen. The best ways you can help us keep this party going is to donate at ProductHappyHour.com slash support. That's a mouthful. And uh, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. With me, as always, is Ira Joe Hall. Hey, Ira. Hi. Yep. At PHH, we share a zero BS, zero fluff approach um, to learning how to become a seasoned PM. Basically, we're sharing the war stories you only hear at happy hour with your industry friends. And I've got my drink, I've got my product friend, there he is, and I'm ready to roll. Fire, fire, fire. All right, today we're covering qualitative research, quantitative research, and the relationship between the two. Trippy episode this week, y'all. Lots of counterintuitive stuff in here. But first, day in the life of a product manager era, how was your day? <laughs> in the famous words of Ice Cube, today was a good day. Uh, <laughs> We we're recording on a weekend and this weekend I turned off my Slack notifications and dude, I even turned off my text notifications. Wow. And yeah, I spent the better part of the weekend and today like hanging out with close friends and family doing some birthday things. And, very nice. Uh, Happy yeah. birthday. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. We uh, cruised around on a speedboat. I live in San Francisco, so we took it out into the bay and we stopped at a little marina diner. For those of you Bay Area natives, you might have heard of Sam's, but they has they have this cool thing called sail side service where you can like roll up in your boat. I guess swim up, paddle up in your boat is probably more appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was cool. They'll like feed you food on the boat. And yeah, this was so good. If this weekend was like a product, it's getting five stars on the app store, dude. <laughs> Nice. Are you, were you like a Roman emperor, like a senator just sitting there? They just like, you lay down and they just kind of like drop food in your mouth. So that's how it works. That's how it's working in my mind. Like a big vegan burger. Just like, can you? (laughs) I can't imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Just a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. But, uh, naturally all weekends must come to an end and it's time to mull over product learnings with a cocktail. Couldn't agree more. Perfect segue into our next segment. What's that drink, Ira? What are we drinking today? Um, I brought this bottle, but I swear I'm not drinking right out of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I believe you. That was you. yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, today I'm, because it's like 12 o'clock, I'm drinking a mimosa because it's like prime brunch time on the mm-hmm. West Coast. And isn't it funny how like OJ and champagne is like totally acceptable alcoholic morning beverages. But if I showed up to this podcast with a fifth of fireball, you'd be like, what the hell are you doing? (laughs) Just fireball, the breakfast of champions. It does seem a touch more aggressive than champagne. (laughs) You're right. Okay. What bevy do you have in that PHH pint glass? All right. Today I have a Dallas Blonde made by Deep Ellum Brewing in my hometown of Dallas, Texas. This sucker has got a little bit of kick, which is really great. Oh, yeah? And I've got it here. Yeah, it's awesome. I've got it here in my Product Happy Hour beer mug. Uh, all right. Like Happy Hour, we've got our great drinks. Let's dive in to Cool Product Things, where we talk about a cool product thing that represents a key product concept era. It's your turn this week. What do you have for us? Okay, I'm so excited to tell you about this. My cool product thing is tonal PRs. So a little bit of background. My germ aversion, which I am so OCD, but yeah, it hit like all-time highs during the pandemic, as you might nice. imagine. Of so I made an investment in um, an at-home weightlifting system called Tonal just to keep my body from turning into like a squishy blob while the gyms were closed. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey always sees it like in the background of my zoom but um yep. yeah it's not a tv it's actually digital weights and it's kind of new to the gym market it's like less than five years old and if you're having trouble envisioning it it's basically a compact cable machine like you might see at the gym with a flat screen attached to it 
And you can basically do any lift, like I'm talking deadlifts, bicep curls, chest yeah. flies on this thing, and it'll digitally record your exercise and the weight and the volume of your sets. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. I mean, so cool. that's great. Yeah, that's, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It sounds good in theory, but it's also really cool in practice because the next time you attempt the same lift, it bumps up your weight for you. And if you're able to complete the set at that higher weight, it rewards you. And that's what a tonal PR is or tonal personal record. It uh, makes a cute little sound. I would uh, intim uh, I would do it right now, but it's probably not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get sponsored by tonal. You could try. try and make that I'll sound. just, uh, you could try. It's I'll like, just edit it out. <laughs> it's like, boo boo. <laughs> I'm keeping it. I'd, I'm definitely oh, keeping that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know why I made my eyes like that for those watching the video feed. Boo -boo. <laughs> okay, and it, it gives you a visual on the flat screen. <laughs> it's basically like a full full screen notification that lets you know you hit a personal record for that lift. So why is this a cool product thing? Well, basically eliminated like nine million steps of friction. The first being mm. I don't have to remember what my the last like weight was and set or rep style that I did or volume for that exercise. And second, it has intelligence required to know like what the next weight up should be for me. Like I am mostly squishy blob. So it's not like 20 pounds higher, you know, for Miss Joe Hall. It's not doing that. Because, <laughs> you know, what I mean, mean, I don't know about you. <laughs> Maybe. I tend to like I'm tend to, I tend to like underestimate how much weight I can actually lift. So yeah. this actually like digitally kind of like encourages me to start, you know, getting more and more weight under my belt. And it has all my exercises and all my weight and all my volume stored. So essentially, it's 100% personalizing the pace and weight that I aim for next. Isn't it wow. just, I'm like, okay, okay, like, I'm never going like, what's better than this? What more could I ask for? Oh, I could ask for a hard body and not have to do any of this work. But <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> Okay, and last, on. Yeah, yeah. Working on it. yeah, so last but not least, the tonal personal record alert is positive reinforcement. It quietly and seamlessly ups your weight for you. And if you perform it, you know, like I said, it provides a tone. But also like now my brain is like wired to celebrate when I hear that noise. And mm -hmm. so is my fiance like, we're both working from home, right? So we're both using this expensive behemoth we bought. And yep. sometimes I'll hear him working out. And if I'm like within earshot and I hear the PR tone, I'm like, oh my God, good job, you did babe. It. You did it. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. it's just like dripping with like good habit loop design, right? Yeah. I really love how it leans into its strengths, right? It's a yeah. digital system and it's taking full advantage of that aspect with data-driven personalized features. Knowing you hit a personal record is definitely going to make the product sticky and make it hard to go back to lifting analog weights. Like, why would you do that? It does all this <laughs> stuff for you. It, it actually reminds me of um, Peloton implemented this thing where you can lock your resistance and it'll Ooh. automatically change your resistance for you. And I'm oh my so, God, so cool. Like, why would I ever go back to a normal spin bike? So I totally get it. This sounds- That is amazing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like my squat rack at my like dirty, smelly, you know, slightly sweat glazed gym equipment is never gonna like give me a celebration when I hit a PR. It's gonna, I'm never yeah. going back. Probably not. And if it did, you'd freak out. You'd be like, what yeah. is that? Well, I'm just going to like <laughs> try to punch it and break my hand. Uh, <laughs> definitely true. All right. Well, we've got quite the show for everybody today. Um, just a quick breakdown of today's show. PMs need a, a combination of both quantitative data and qualitative data to make healthy bets on how to shape their product. That's pretty common knowledge. But what we are going to cover is how to avoid making rookie mistakes when interpreting these inputs by examining the relationship between 
quant and qual, or quantitative or qualitative. Uh, first, we'll define the concepts of quant and qual with real life examples from our experience. Second, we share how to avoid common pitfalls by teaching you how to respect the relationship between quant and qual. And last, but certainly not least, we will give you an insightful cheat sheet aptly named what could have saved us pain if we <laughs> knew this earlier in our careers. This one's worth saying tuned for. It has some solid takeaways that will undoubtedly save you from wasting dev cycles because you'll have had the benefit of learning from your product friends. That's us here at happy hour. Let's awesome. do it. Ready? Let's do this. So All good. Right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Boom. fact that to know that they're over there thinking like, how can we make this experience even better knowing that it's a digital product in your house? It's just like, that just, that's, you know, in a lot of ways, that's just like great marketing. It really <sighs> just kind of makes you so want to go out and buy one. That's why I'm like, maybe we should get yeah. Tonal to sponsor some of this stuff so we can get some free shit. I mean, <laughs> hit us up because Tonal is like such a game changer and we talk about game changing products here. Yeah. So if you guys want to be continued plugged, you'll keep, you'll send us a discount code at least. That's right. And we can do some like crazy <laughs> thing. Be like, hey, if you're a product manager and you want to be at your best at your game, like, uh, you know, buy Total. Get a whatever. Total. <laughs> <So good. laughs> Watch like 10 episodes from now. I'm totally going to be reading that ad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Art All imitates right. well, life, people. <laughs> I I got to tell you, like, it's so they have PMs at Tonal and they are so fire because the software yeah. updates, the features just get better and not worse. Yeah. Like now there's like digital trainers and more programs. Oh, that's, yeah. Okay. And they that's tell amazing. you what muscle group is fatigued based on your last workout. They're like, mm, don't try your quads again. You tore those up last time. Let's do arms. That's fire. That's fire. Yeah. Man. Okay. I know. All right. Cool. I'll be spending my whole week in Miami on uh, on the Tonal website. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go in and talk a little bit about these concepts. Um, so what is quantitative data? Well, let me tell you. Quantitative data is basically numbers about your product. That includes like dashboards that show metrics, data from queries you might run, basically anything numeric or data related that represents user behavior, key business metrics or trends. Like one of the things I define, I, I think about as quant is um, basically anything that, you know, you see no user face, you hear no user voice, but it's just the calculated effect of a group of people doing things on your site. Oh, yeah, I like so that. yeah, should I give you some examples? Let's do it. Maybe I'll give some examples. Okay, here's mm -hmm. some real life examples of quantitative data from my experience in the e-commerce space. And just a note about this, like maybe you're like a starting out or you're at a smaller product shop and you hear this list and you're like, well, I don't have that data available. Um, don't worry because PMs are actually also responsible for driving research roadmaps. So if you think that the data that you hear about here is valuable, but it's not available, then, you know, your task at hand is simply to, you know, ask your closest research partner or data scientists if it's something that could be collected. And naturally, you know, we always like want more than the data we actually have. So it's not like, it's not rare that it's not available. And also most of the data isn't really ready to interpret. So this can still be useful in helping you kind of tee up the collection of this data um, and knowing what to ask for before is just as useful as learning how to interpret the data. So this will probably still save you time if it's not there, right, Ajay? Yeah, incredible skill. That's actually one of the things to learn is is really, you know, what to ask for is. Um, so yeah, that's, that's such a great point. That's That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. So in e-commerce, our, our key metric usually involves sales of X. It could be anything. Typical quant data that I've sourced in my last couple of roles really has to do with uh, sales by demographic. So it doesn't matter if you're sending, selling like dog leashes or water bottles. It doesn't matter. This is the very bottom of the sales funnel. And mm -hmm. this is pretty typical data that you'll look at when you're trying to evaluate that product's performance. So um, here's a happy hour version of this advice. 
demographic isn't simply revenue by country or mobile versus desktop sales. You actually need to look a little deeper to unlock insightful quant. So for example, uh, one of my search roles, we plotted sales over different slices of time and different demographics, and we got some game changing insights. Mm. Um, we found that like four to 9 PM is peak media consumption for the over 18 demographic in English speaking countries. I know that sounds very specific and you might need a lot of information to come up with that insight, but if you have it, I mean, knowing the peaks and pits of sales cycles and the demographic that maps to it can expose super cool products of opportunity. Like this information totally changed how I targeted and ran my A-B test. Oh, like yeah. I, I might examine the weekend data separately or only bucket users for my feature who like fit this, uh, like what I call opportunity demographic. Ajay, do you have any other interesting examples of quant like that? Yeah, totally. Just building on this one, um, one example that comes to mind is uh, a different marketplace I worked on. Well, <clears throat> for context, there was two different marketplaces. Um, okay. And in one of them, the sales cycle um, in total would take weeks. You know, people would evaluate the different okay. options they had over a week or weeks long time frame. Uh, and often they were doing it with other people, you know, you would okay. you'd get together and you talk about the products that are available and discuss them and look at the different features and stuff. And so it would happen over a week's long time frame. But then this other marketplace, people were making decisions like same day on the spot. It was much more of like an impulse purchase. They would I sign see. up and then, you know, they weren't really discussing or researching that much. Most people like 80, 90 plus people were making decisions same day. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can imagine if you're in a marketplace where people are making decisions over weeks long, uh, that's a very different experience that you probably want to have than for people that are trying to make a decision like right away. Um, yeah. It's like a, a fundamentally different type of experience. And for that snap decision making, you probably want to make sure data is available immediately. You know, you probably don't want to be... Yeah. Um, messing around, screwing around, and 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 not showing people stuff that they need access to right away. So, so that's kind of one so quantitative good. example uh, that mm -hmm. I think of. Um, and another one is uh, you know sales and sales cycles is a good one. Another quantitative example that we talk about a lot is engagement data collected from site and device behaviors. So clicks, views, revisits. These are top of the sales funnel and can be really powerful. But a game-changing quant analysis I did uh, was to look at engagement and conversion drivers. What behaviors map to successful conversion, essentially? Oh my gosh, so good. And so yeah. instead of just like looking at the raw behavior counts, you're like looking at like patterns of behavior that result in sales. Did I get that right? That's right, exactly. So the background here was that we did a study where we looked at our engagement and conversion data through a few specific lenses, frequency of use, conversion rate at those frequency rates and volume at, the, at those rates. And through that analysis, we found some really interesting behaviors. For example, users, when they are deeper in the conversion funnel on things like cart, or checkout are surprise <laughs> ready to check out and uh, <laughs> you have a few shots at making that happen um, so you want to focus on on getting people to essentially purchase uh, in that part of the experience set, instead of getting them out to something else um, that's that's a really critical part does that make sense Hira? oh yeah totally so okay this sounds um, I don't want to say complex but it sounds like there's probably a few different like steps needed to like extract that level of information? Do you think you need like a data scientist to be able to do this? Or could you just like do this without a math degree if you just had more time? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you can get to high level insights on your own if you have SQL skills and your site is okay. instrumented. Uh, but there are also some commercially available tools that you can use to interpret uh, quantitative data. I really like uh, mixed mammal and amplitude. Have you heard of this? Oh my gosh, those are way more self-serve than like issuing like a SQL statement on like some massive data lake. Um, I yeah. remember like when I started at um, a new role, it's really hard to like 
get all the permissions, get all the tools, figure out what tables have what, you know, like historically any company I've worked on my career, like documentation is there, but is it up to date? No. Mm -hmm. Is there a how to on it? No. <laughs> like mm -hmm. on your own. So like I get a lot of value out of these tools where they've like, you know, companies have completely outsourced the representation, um, the access to tables and done the instrumentation of stringing up like events, uh, digital events that are happening on your digital experience to like interpretation tools. So yeah, I, I really like that. You can take like clicks and views and dwell time, which is really important for search and funnel that into a really cool UI. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you you know, data science is extremely, extremely useful. And this is actually a good topic for the podcast. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. For very complicated analysis, like what I was talking about earlier. Um, but, you know, things like Mixpanel and Amplitude are really great self-service products uh, where you can basically search and investigate data slices of user behavior on your site or app mm -hmm. to get a quantitative view for X segment, time period, uh, or cohort. Um, right on yeah. your own, you know, and it really right. saves you some time while your data scientists can do a lot of the really, really more complicated stuff. Right. And like the more bespoke stuff, like I swear we're not sponsored by Mixpanel or Amplitude or Tonal <laughs> at this point, guys. Yeah. I swear. <laughs> For real. They're just really legit product experiences. They're so good. Um, but AJ, can you take us into examples of cool and interesting qualitative data? Yeah. <clears throat> For sure. So uh, before we do that, let's define qualitative data. Uh, okay, good Qualitative point. data. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Very important. Didn't mean to talk over you. That's how, <laughs> that's how important it is. I was like, let's define it. <laughs> um, okay, so qualitative data is basically what users actually tell you, like what Hero is mm -hmm. saying with their face and actual audio oftentimes, uh, usually in user research settings. This can also happen in one-on-one -on -one consumer conversations or direct written user feedback. Um, it's user contributed data that is more descriptive of the qualities or characteristics of whatever you're studying. It might mm -hmm. look like a user study where you are asking, for example, we don't work at Uber, uh, but for example, Uber drivers, how their experience was with navigation software. It could be asking a vacation home renter to rate and describe the accuracy of amenities, things like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, you know, the um, the stuff that you like would hear if you asked a friend like, oh, what did you think about that? They were like, oh, well, that experience sucked. Um, it's that kind yeah. of data. Um, so it's more the voice of the customer as opposed to the actions that they took, which are like facts, right? It's their mm -hmm. opinion about it. Um, yeah. 100%. Uh, so some useful quantitative data that I've gra gathered is um, listening to interviews of both sides of a marketplace I was working on, both the the consumers that are coming to to buy things on our marketplace mm -hmm. and the suppliers or sellers of those things on the other side of the marketplace, you could really hear the frustrations that our suppliers and uh, our consumers were having um, with various things like the stagnation of uh, features on the mark on the marketplace. This can help us inform a decision to instrument various parts of the consumer experience with click and view events. So we could learn more about the behaviors related to uh, the negative or positive sentiment shared in the survey or instrumenting supply side features for suppliers to better understand where they're getting hung up in uh, the process yeah. of getting their inventory onto the platform and, and really trying to understand that better. So you can, so you can better marry the two, which we're going to talk about a little later. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and because you can't like call up user Bob and be like, Bobby, tell me what was it like yeah. um there's there's definitely some tools in place to actually allow you to gather this qualitative data um i've used a lot of bad ones but mm -hmm. why don't you tell us if you've used any good ones yeah and and i will say before we hop into that uh the the tooling and stuff one of the things that is interesting about qualitative is you, you have to do it very well you, you know you want to make right. sure and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later um but you know, you can talk to Bob 
but you have to know how to, <laughs> you have to learn how to talk to Bob. You know, you can't. Oh, so you can't just be like, Bobby, Bobby. hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a practice to that. There's the, there's a science to that um, <laughs> and doing that well. Um, and what we're going to talk about here in a bit, but um, you know, you can do that, but there are lots of other different types of qualitative data tools that help control for those types of things. So naturally, yeah, there are lots of different mechanics to collect the different types. But my current favorite is Full Story. You can actually watch your user's digital experience, and it classifies things like rage clicks. Uh, I found uh, super super useful. Uh, it yeah. increasingly, uh, it, it it interestingly gives you um, the quant on the qual. You know, you can you can really watch and extract the voice of the enraged customer. Um, and it's, it's motivating because you can really see the frustration, which is, um, which is really great. But there's lots of ways of getting at it. Yeah. The full story is awesome. I've totally like mouse clicked. I also hear my partner like slam his mouse when <laughs> his trading software isn't working. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. It's cool. Like full story. You can like, you can literally it. see the session. So cool. Yeah. It's really amazing. Um, also a little creepy because we're like watching your mouse movements, guys. But I think we force you to sign off on that before we do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's really, uh, you know, being able to see a lot of those nuances is so mm -hmm. helpful. I mean, we're not doing it just, you know, the, I think product managers around the world, hopefully they're not like, oh, my God, you're telling everybody your secrets. It's not really a secret, <laughs> but, you yeah. know. Uh, it's not intended to spy on everybody or, or anything like that. It's really just to understand like what everybody's doing within the context of, of using your product. You know, people when they're using their products are are in system one. Shout out to the first pod. Uh, it's worth That's giving right. them a Episode listen. One. Yeah, and most people when they're in system one are doing things out of habit or, or not completely have uh, all the way thinking about what they're doing. So really watching them in their environment is really, really helpful. So it's not... We're not trying yeah. to be creepy. It's all anonymized. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, we're really and we're trying to make it better. Like, imagine if the yeah. DMV watched you annoyingly go to six different counters <sighs> before you yeah. could get your license reviewed. Like, they would probably design a better DMV. Like, that's what PMs are doing when they're that's watching. Right. They're they're trying to make it better. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, not worse. Worse, but okay. Yeah. 100%. So, would you say? Ajay, that uh, quant and qual are equally as important or is one better than the other? What should like a new PM focus on? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think they're both important to use together and the relationship between them is super interesting. Let's get into that, shall we? Okay, let's go. All right. So my hope for this segment is that every PM and future PM walks away able to use quant and qual together effectively. Does that sound like a good, uh, good goal? Uh, that is a very good goal. And this is um, my third mimosa of this episode. <laughs> Quantitatively, I may still be sober enough to finish this podcast, but maybe we'll get the whole story once the qual is available in the comments. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Leave us a comment on YouTube or a rating on Spotify if you thought uh, this part of the episode was particularly good, but the episode overall. Yeah. Let us know. Uh, yeah. Let us know. Okay. So um, here's my first takeaway. When you perform a qualitative user study, you need to know what cohort uh, the people that you're talking to are in and to really understand how to apply the insight, you know, demographics. Okay contacts, cohort, Gen Z versus millennial, you know, you really want to know um, what these cohorts are because they can really kind of shape, you know, the, uh, the information and what you should extract out of the information. And I'll use a, a really generic example. Uh, so Boneboss is a, a SOX website, um, which I bought stuff on Boneboss. Have you? No, I, I'm wearing them right now. I would show you, but I'm <laughs> okay. not that flexible yet. <laughs> well, if I was wearing socks, I, uh, I would, I would show you, I would try to show you mine and probably hurt myself. Um, but uh, you know, I think what, what, um, so like, let's say, you know, we're designing bone bus and, and you're talking to, um, you know, different users in your user study. Maybe there's, uh, just for the sake of example, let's, let's say we talked to four users and okay. one user was like, um, 
a millennial buying socks for his toddler. That's probably me. Um, and let's say another one is um, like a millennial mom buying socks for a soccer team. You know, they have okay. socks for, for the soccer team in, their, in, their, in those colors. Maybe you have somebody that's more of like a senior citizen looking for comfortable socks to help them make sure they don't fall. Um, and maybe it's like um, an eight-year-old kid browsing the site and then eventually their parents are going to purchase them something, for example. Um, okay, super different needs, super different users. Super different needs, super different users, super different user feedback. You can imagine you're probably going to get a lot different feedback from an eight-year-old yeah. Uh, than you would from a 70 year old. <laughs> I know it sounds like a little bit of a, uh, uh, not a common example, but it could happen, you know? Um, no, it, those are like, there are products that have that age range, or at least the journey starts with an eight year old and ends with an 80 year old purchase. Like that is very common, right? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you might get like, like, you know, uh, spoken feedback from them. Um, that's, that's very different um, so somebody in their 70s probably wants a lot of accessibility features to make the site easier to use. And, and they're probably right. really concerned about very specific features around accessibility versus the eight-year-old is probably more interested in like the Sesame Street socks, which they have. I have some um, <laughs> that my son and I share. Uh, and, oh, so you know, cute. is probably interested in like, oh, this is so cool they have that rather than, you know, things like accessibility features. So you want to marry a lot of what you hear with a lot of the data that you see and where people are struggling. Right. So, you know, you might see that different age cohort, cohort is struggling with a certain part of the site that has accessibility problems, but the eight-year-old is struggling more with the top of funnel experience because they're not finding the, the brand that they're, they're interested in in particular. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's why it's really important to understand, like, who you're talking to, which cohorts they right. fall into, and how to apply that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, like you don't want to take the eight-year-old's feedback and change a whole site based on, you know, uh, you know, their input because that's going to marginalize some of your other users. I think like, if I'm honest, it's really hard to figure out who your users are from just looking at quant or just looking at qual. So I really like that you highlighted that you need a little bit of both. Um, and conversely, you know, not to make the opposite argu argument, but more or less a complementary argument, many of the blind spots of quantitative data, like the numbers, are addressed by qualitative data, the, the customer's voice. So basically, you should like to like continue on with our alcohol analogy, you should have like the equivalent of beer goggles or mimosa goggles, depending on what you're drinking today, yeah. uh, when you look at quant. <laughs> um don't do that for other situations guys just just this <laughs> yep. yeah well more clearly what i mean is don't take quant at face value instead get a little more color from the customer voice before you make a time intensive or cost intensive product decision like there is no team that wants to be dragged down based on your like little tiny sliver of research into like a multi-sprint project Right, mm -hmm. like Ajay, I know you've experienced this uh, too. Too many it's times. It's happy hour. You can tell us too many times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm halfway down the beer. Yeah, it's, it's too many times, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so here here's a real life example where you can like learn from my pain. Okay, mm -hmm. we were trying to understand how to improve the search experience for rare sneakers, so we looked at the health of a query like Nike Air Max on this big e-commerce site that shall not be named. Mm. Uh, we had su uh, supply, but um, the top results weren't getting clicked. Okay. Like what the hell? Mm. Based on the quant, the top five results had like a really low click rate. And if you've worked in search or know about search, like that's a negative signal. Okay. We spent all this money writing a ranking model and no one is clicking on the shit on the top. It's like not good. Um, so, you know, what we do is when we have a negative conversion signal, we retrain our model or we go and investigate new features. These can take sprints, man. Like this is yeah. like, not like, it's not simple. Hmm. So yeah, we, we could have done this, but, um, yeah, it would have taken us down the wrong path. Um, because we had a feedback survey on the, uh, sneaker listing page 
So this is double-sided marketplace where individuals can list sneakers. Mm. And, you know, I really don't pay attention to this survey too much because it's for literally every product and it's kind of generic. Mm -hmm. And I don't really look at it every day. It's just too much. Like it'd be like reading a novel on everything from like, you know, Q-tips to like <laughs> Ford trucks. Yeah. Those are like, the, those are categories on this website. Wow. Yeah. So um, yeah, I ended up wondering like, why aren't we're doing this big marketing campaign for rare sneakers like the Yeezys and all the new Nikes and mm -hmm. all the like retro Jordans like why are people not clicking on the on these results and I looked at the survey because I don't know I, I had some sense back then yeah and <laughs> our sellers were filling out the listing feedback survey and there was a comment in there about how the latest Nike Air Max wasn't actually even available yet. Like, meaning Nike had not even released it. And what we were showing on our site was actually a bunch of counterfeits. Oh. So the sellers in this category, I know, I was like, mind blown emoji. Where is that reaction? Yeah. <laughs> the sellers were like super eager to have search down rank these counterfeits, which was the exact opposite of what I was about to do. Yeah. I was going to like try and figure out how to get them more visibility oh, um, because they didn't want counterfeits in their category because when they try and sell the real thing at the right price point, um, they wouldn't be able to compete. So re-ranking a bunch of counterfeits fits would actually, you know, really like isn't going to help the sale of uh, like this really important sneaker to sneakerheads. The sell the buyers who were coming there were like, oh, these are counterfeits. That's mm. why I'm not going to buy them. But the quant data is like, oh, these are really popular sneakers. They're showing in position one. We're getting a ton of views and no clicks. Like, but nowhere in the quant is it going to say that these are counterfeits and yeah. not attractive to buy, right? So super interesting. Super interesting. I, it's probably such a gut punch to hear that. But <laughs> yes. also probably shared, it probably saved future era a lot of pain. <laughs> oh my gosh. Run that so test much. and you would have been like, why is this happening? And just would have made yeah. a bad situation worse. Um, yeah. And I learned what trust and safety is. So I was like, oh, I got to report these listings so they yeah. can get taken down. So the yeah. algorithm can actually match people to stuff that's good, you know? Yeah. I, I And sometimes when you listen to quantitative, sometimes they validate something that, uh, that can apply to everybody and do very well with everyone. Like the counterfeit example, nobody mm -hmm. likes counterfeit. Like who wants to buy counterfeits? Right. You know? Um, right. That's a, that's a really great example. That's of something that would hit all demographics. Something that I've seen is, is, um, uh, you know, a uh, case where you're being able to take a lot of the content that people, people want and bringing that forward and pulling that forward. Mm -hmm. That's always, mm -hmm. you know, something that does really well mm -hmm. with lots and lots of different demographics. And I've seen examples where you'd run the quant 10 out of 10 users say like, this thing is awesome. And then you run the, yeah. the uh, I'm sorry, you run the qual and 10 out of 10 say oh. uh, that this is awesome. But then you run the quant AB test and it just blows it out of the water. Now you have a good sense of like yeah. why these things work. Yes. Um, oh, when they line up. Yeah. Oh, so satisfying. It's so satisfying. And it is <laughs> so good. It only it only happens just so everybody knows. Some it happens sometimes because thanks to system one and system two. Again, shouting out to episode one. Um <laughs> what people say and do in research studies versus what they do on the site is is very different often. Um so yeah. having these two things, dimensions and learning how to marry them together is really, really important for that reason. Uh, super, yes, totally. super, super interesting stuff. Okay. Let's share that insightful cheat sheet on how listeners can save themselves from misinterpreting the qual and the quant. Sound good? Oh, yes. Yes. I wish I had this earlier in my career. Yeah. So all you PMs out there, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, cool. All <laughs> right. Let's just bear, uh, let's just barrel right into it. Okay. Number one, Question framing matters. I talked about this a little earlier, um, but you really want to understand the questions you're asking customers. Um, usually, you know, uh, you might have to do this yourself if you're like a smaller shop mm -hmm. um, or mm -hmm. maybe you're starting on a product that's new and you're not getting uh, tons of resourcing just yet. So you might have to do this yourself, but oftentimes, you know, you'll be working with 
uh, if you're in a bigger shop, you're you're working with a user researcher um, uh, yeah. or somebody in 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 product marketing that can kind of help you craft these surveys. And so you want to make sure that you're um, not baking in assumptions into your qualitative survey. So you want to always pick apart your your questions and make sure that the your assumptions are not leaking out uh, when you're when you're talking mm -hmm. to users. Uh, you also want to understand. So guilty of this. I do. I you know I, I think I might have said this in in an earlier pod. I've definitely done a lot of this. I actually, you know, blasphemy on my part. I used to uh, just be like, I don't really get why we have to craft these survey questions and like really be diligent about it. Now I know because this stuff is super yeah, well, important. We learned. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and I did a lot of that earlier on in my career. So everybody that's listening here, that's. Uh, that's earlier on. <laughs> Don't do that. You know, <laughs> try to get some help, uh, do some research, you know, talk to talk to some great folks in your company that can help you with that. Same with bias. You know, what bias are you introducing in your questions? Uh, you know, you mm -hmm. can really easily introduce bias in your questions. So, so make sure you're working with somebody, even somebody that can just hear you out, another PM and, and uh, mm -hmm. call you on some of this stuff to make sure you change it. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, trying to get research support that could help you construct a survey that gets at the info you need to make a product decision. Like, you know, often if you've got a great user t research team, use them. It's worth taking the time uh, to work with them and, and be more diligent about that. It's totally 100% worth it. You don't want to run with the wrong wrong insights. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I've totally d d done the sentence construction and baked in an, a bias. <sighs> like there's one that's common, the positivity bias, where yeah. I'm like, how good do you think this page is? <laughs> <laughs> Scale of one to 100 billion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't write those alone. Um, and also, if you do not have a research team, there are tons of resources on the internet um, that can help you remove bias just from your conversation or interview style. Like you can apply that if you are forced to construct a survey on your own. And this is like really, like as OJ said, in your best interest. Um, the cleaner the data you get, the more interpretable it is. And if you've interpreted it well, because you've constructed it well, you can actually action on those and not have to run a full dev cycle based on kind of crappy questions that then gave you crappy answers and then gave you a crappy product. Really <laughs> I got to fix it a little higher in the funnel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, here's number two. Okay. Literal interpretation of the summary isn't good enough. Mm. You learn, isn't that a good one? You learn That's more when you watch and observe people in the wild. So yeah, this is this is not to Ajay because he uses full story, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, I do now. But it's you, you're actually looking at the mouse and tap behavior, um, real life in the wild versus one of these constructed prototypes where you set up like a fake version of your site and then you ask questions and then they do the behavior as they, you ask the questions. You don't actually see natural behavior when you do that. And that will just screw you out of learning how people really interact with your feature. Um, so like you get to an A-B test um, and you should instrument it, um, not just with metrics, but also with tools like full story, like Ajay was talking about, because I always prefer this option when, it, when it's possible over the prototyping questionnaire, because you get a combo of actual A-B test quant mm -hmm. with a qual, um, and there's no weird like paid participants who are using your new feature and then are asking questions. Like I always find them to be overly positive. I don't know. Yeah. It's because they're getting paid, Ajay. Like, have yeah. you found that? I have. And they don't, they, <laughs> oftentimes it's not even just that they're getting paid. I, I think certainly that that has a, a role to play in it, but also they just, you know, users want to make a good impression, you know, <laughs> like they, mm -hmm. and they're, they're talking to often a company that they use and, and they like, so, you know, they don't want yeah, to just, that's a good point. you know, they don't want to just come out and be like, Hey, you guys suck. You know, sometimes they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes it definitely happens. <laughs> um, and that's how you build a thick skin. But then sometimes it's just like, they just, uh, don't want you to feel bad. Um, right. But then that's where right. things like full story or things like the quantitative data really helps keep a lot of that honest for sure. That's, that's why right. we need both. Right. Okay. That's so good. So yeah, yeah, those can be riddled with bias. Yeah, totally. So good. So, all right. So number three, don't underestimate the power of cohorts. We talked about it earlier. Uh, what is a cohort? A cohort is basically just a group of people. 
Um, and it's okay. groupings of people, cohorts are just groupings of people. Um, and this can happen on different dimensions. It can happen on device type. It can happen on age. Okay. It can happen on country. Okay. Um, and the reason this is important is because often, like we talked about, uh, sorry, I burped in the mic. Uh, that's a beer. So <laughs> we're drinking, man. We're at that part of the happy hour, okay? Like this is just okay. what happens. Um, so, so okay, <laughs> it's like a high def burp. <laughs> <laughs> right in the mic. Okay, so um, okay, why is this important? So oftentimes, when uh, and this is important in both contexts, like we were talking about earlier qualitatively you're going to hear things from users in different cohorts that apply differently in different cohorts um so okay. you know different ages different countries something you might hear in japan or germany or france is going to be might be unique to that country relative to other countries um but okay. you also are going to see this in quantitative data oftentimes what happens is you might see an overall change, for example, in your quantitative metrics. Maybe things went up and to the right and you're like, yeah, we killed it everywhere. But in reality, uh, what you're seeing is one specific country having like a gangbuster quarter that's pulling all mm -hmm. of your numbers up. But the other oh. countries are oh my gosh. neutral, you know, and this can happen oh, overall that's such a good point. AB, AB test metrics. Uh, you know, cohorts, you really need them to really understand mm -hmm. really what you're looking at. Uh, you reacted pretty strongly. You ever experienced that sort of stuff? Uh, dude, I don't even know. Of course, yeah. of course I am. I have been tricked so much by so much quant so often. Um, I, I almost feel like it doesn't matter how much experience you have or like how much training you have. Like you will learn by fire mm -hmm. because A-B testing is king but it's also like a dark horse. I'm like, oh, my future, my future was amazing. <laughs> Look at this left. And then you do the ad hoc analysis and it's like, oh no, it was just all Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. uh, or like some very small, like some segment, um, which I hadn't intended, but and that's what an A-B test is. You're trying to learn if your hypothesis is right, yeah. but you need to interpret a little bit deeper than just like, face value or key metrics. And that's where cohorts come into play. 100%. 100%. I love it. All right. Bring us home, Mira. Okay. So last but not least, always ask yourself, how trustworthy is your data? Now, I told you, like, I want you to learn from my pain. <laughs> my hot tip is, it doesn't matter how amazing your instrumentation is, how many cool tools you use. But if you don't know the source of the data and the limitations of that data, even if it's quant, it's like, do not interpret it. Do not try and make judgments based on data that you cannot trust. And this seems like, oh, like, duh, I wouldn't do that. But I have learned that if you have some metrics that you really care about, invest and partner with your engineers to go and make sure that monitoring is set up for those metrics. Mm -hmm. Because you set it up once and you're like, aha, I'm invented, I'm instrumented, look at my beautiful dashboard. But let's say an event drops or someone makes a, a code change. Like you're not looking at that every day. Yeah. Um, you may be looking at it when you make decisions, which might be like, you know, on a quarterly pace or like by sprint, like every two sprints. Make sure that you've set up monitoring for the metrics that matter most so that if you do have a drop in data, like for example, you're only collecting 80% of clicks, but then interpreting it as if it's a hundred percent of that cohort, um, you'll have a monitor in place that actually says like, okay, this, these are all green. So this is all reliable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, have your team take the time to set up monitoring so that you know your quant is reliable and thus interpretable. 100%. It's like I can feel all of the data scientists watching this pod or listening to this pod just being like, thank you. Like, this is probably <laughs> the hardest part of quant, I think, yeah. is uh, it's not always just interpreting the results. It's making sure that the data is quality data and that everything right. is firing the way it's supposed to fire. Um, man, critical, critical uh, part of the cheat sheet here. And it's, uh, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's last one. Hopefully it's the one you remember the most. <laughs> yeah for sure all right episode five in the can oh we did it we, we did it we did it did it 
sober i hope uh, sort barely. Of, oh, i was halfway sober all right well uh thank you <laughs> thank you for uh joining us for product happy hour if you enjoyed happy hour today please support us by donating on our podcast website ProductHappyHour.com slash support there are monthly one dollar five dollar and ten dollar options we're trying it out donations help us keep this sucker going without too many annoying ads so thank you in advance for your support you can also support the show by following the show on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please also rate the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get the, your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram or TikTok for clips at Product Happy HR. And please share with your friends and spread the word. The more people at the bar, the merrier. Thank you so much <laughs> for listening to the show. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Mm.